Chapter 3 Jacob awoke very late. He looked around him a little confused, not sure at once where he was. Then he jumped up and went to the window. Oh, I'm in Val Descotra, he said. He thought back to last night, but hardly knew what he was seeking. His head did not ache. He felt light and fresh. Only a weariness lay in him, a pleasantly murmuring fatigue that slumbered in all of his limbs. He laughed to himself. Oh, yes, he had been drinking, just as in the old days, and he had lifted his voice in song, a hundred songs, a hundred glasses. He had sung and he had drunk, but with whom? There was Papino Raimondi, the landlord, and Herr Aloy Drinker, the fat border guard. True, and he had drunk the latter under the table. And then, what had happened then? He sat up on the edge of the bed, recalling it all. Yes, that was it. He had found his goal. A faith had come to him. His glance passed almost caressingly over the table, which was stacked high with books and papers. And now it would no longer be like work. Now it would be mere child's play. Jacob was ecstatic. The wine gave me all that as a gift, he said. Of what use is thought? The wise men have visions, and then they understand. His eyes rested on his garments. They lay confused and scattered on the floor. That was hardly his way. Had he been that completely drunk? Yet even so, he bent down to pick up his coat, but in doing so saw his hand. Long scratches ran diagonally across them. He went to the mirror. His face showed little wounds and tears all over. Coagulated blood clung to the edges. What was that? He closed his eyes, passed his hand across his forehead. But he was not seeking in his memory. No. He almost fought against these thoughts. When he shook his head, his lips were tightly pressed. They drooped with an expression of harsh resignation, as from a feeling of intensely conscious suffering. This is useless, he said. I can't even forget. He went around the room, gathered his garments, and laid them across the bed. He strode up and down with long, firm steps. Very well, then, Jacob continued. One must bring order out of all of this chaos. He noticed that he was speaking out loud and laughed at himself. Yes, yes, like all people who are alone a lot. Intelligent people, he said. He stood for a moment and then walked around again. He drank a glass of water and lit a cigarette. He exhaled the smoke vigorously, and then he cried out loud and sharply, as if lashing himself. Let's get this over with. This is what happened, he said. And he broke away stone after stone from the quarries of his recollection, and this is how it had begun. Jacob saw that glimmer of light from the third window, a faint, thin gleam and a spark crept toward him, as if on a long fuse. Jacob saw it coming, felt it speeding closer and closer, swifter and swifter, but he was not afraid. It seemed as if this mine in his breast was awaiting the kiss of that fire with greedy rapture. Body and soul, both were full to the brim, 
let the lightning strike, he thought. He ran to the house and leapt up the stone steps. He glanced into the guest room and saw the guard lying on his face on the floor, grasping his helmet tightly with both hands. So you won't give it up, Jacob laughed. But he flew up the stairs as if fate were driving him. Yes, it was true. What he had thought upon entering his room. It is fate, said Jacob. He stripped off his clothes. In a moment, he was in his pajamas. And out, a strong blast of wind pushed his breath back into his face. Heavy, rank, alcoholic breath. He turned back. His blood still boiled. Yet in that moment, it was restrained by childhood training. I am no animal, Jacob whispered. He went into his bedroom, stepped up to the wash basin. He mixed his mouthwash, gargled and spit, and then brushed his teeth. He washed himself and slowly went back out. He hesitated before her door, almost afraid. He listened but heard nothing. Then swiftly, he turned the knob and entered. He saw the picture of the mother of God with the box tree twigs in the frame. He noticed that three blue pansies had been added. He saw the little holy water basin on the right, and on the left, close by the window, the perpetual lamp. The faint light fell on the girl's bed. She was wide awake. Her large, open eyes stared up at him. Her face seemed pale, and her lips trembled. She didn't speak a word. Her blue eyes turned beseechingly to the mother of God. Her fingers were tightly intertwined. Yes, she was praying. He followed her look. He passed swiftly between her and the Virgin. The Madonna sent me, he said to her passionately. He stretched out his hand, grasped her nightgown, and tore it from her shoulders in long shreds. Her white flesh lay before his eyes, like the foam of the sea. Panting, he repeated, the Madonna sent me. She screamed loudly as he threw himself upon her. She jumped up and pushed him back. He felt her fist in his face, felt her nails dig into his flesh. He grabbed her around the hips, pushed her back, and forced her head down with his right hand. Then somehow, his fingers were between her teeth, he screamed out loud and bit his tongue from the pain. Then he grabbed her braids and twisted them in his other hand, forcing her head deep into the pillows. Her teeth let go of his fingers. His right hand tightened around her throat, while his left twisted her hand, pushing it up high towards her shoulder. And that's how he took her. She did not close her eyes. She did not weep. Motionless, she lay in her pain, looking at him as if he were a horrible, fearful spirit from which there was no escape. And her gaze rested on the hand that imprisoned her arm. That horrible, pitiless, fearful hand. She lay motionless beneath him, no tears. No complaint came from her lips. But then the sudden strength of his wild fists flowed into his soul. Then passion was reborn in him, in a full and pure harmony. He spoke, and his voice was soft and restrained, like distant music. His words sounded strangely alluring in his ears. He knew very well 
that she was compelled to listen to him. All the tender words that had ever been said to beautiful women became alive now, flowed from his lips, all of those and many more, fairer and stranger. He found sounds that intoxicated himself, ingratiating sounds that sang like harps. His words fell like the sweet rain of summer and cooled and covered her naked, tormented body. Then she wept, but he took her in his arms, carefully, tenderly, as if she were a child. His fingers glided over her cheeks like the fragrance of acai blossoms, and his breath played about her temples, trembled in her hair like the fumes of a holy censer. The Madonna wills it whispered. She turned and looked at him, and it seemed to her that this was an entirely different man from the one who had just... this one she did not know. Not him. A great astonishment lay in her silent glance. Only a moment ago. No, she knew no longer what had happened a moment ago. She was lying in the arms of this kind man, of no other, and gently, involuntarily, her fingers pressed his arm. She became frightened again, and withdrew her hand swiftly, but he was not silent. His tongue spoke, and his eyes in his hands. He wove the net mesh by mesh and ensnared her soul with exquisite words of love. She closed her eyes and permitted him to kiss her eyelids. His arms entwined her body more tightly. She felt his pulses hammer against her flesh. A great warmth went out from him and engulfed her. His love enveloped her like a caressing bath. She did not resist when he saw her lips. Now, everything seemed like a dream, and she yielded to him utterly. And he felt how a life grew in his arms. The girl in her was dead, and from the hard chrysalis, the butterfly gently arose, and he tasted the rapture of this victory to the fullest how the woman in her had awakened. She was not ashamed of her caresses. She didn't speak a word, but gave him an entire life of love. A fever seized her, and her teeth that had torn at his fingers in anger and hatred now bit his lip, bit into his shoulder, insatiable in sudden desire. She pressed her breasts into his hands, threw her head back, and offered him her body. She grasped his hair with both hands, pulled him down to her, and greedily drank his hot kisses. Once she lifted herself half up, she screamed, Take me, the Madonna sent you. And then she threw herself upon him, red hot, passionately murmuring, smothering him with kisses and embraces. And she took his hands, they appeared good and beautiful. They were the hands of the man that she loved. She searched for something that she had once seen in those hands, once, long ago. But she couldn't find it and didn't remember what it had been. She kissed his hands over and over. She couldn't stay awake and fell asleep. She did not speak, only lay there.
breathing hotly, moaning, torn away in this male storm of radiant lust. Later, he awoke. He found her slumbering, breathing softly. Her head rested upon his breast. Her arms were intertwined around his shoulders. Carefully, he loosened her hands, got up softly without a kiss, and hurried out. He was surprised to find the door still open, and he went into his room and threw himself upon his own bed. He slept at once, dreamlessly, without moving a limb. And that was how it had been. Jacob arose, went to the window, and gazed upon the sun-drenched lake. A feeling of profound satisfaction enfolded him and blended strangely with his pleasant fatigue. He stretched himself, opened his arms wide, and laughed happily. These had been victories, three mighty victories. I can still drink, as of old, and find revelations, and I can still love, as of old. And he was delighted, but he was still master of the three great arts. He took off his pajamas and went to the mirror naked. With a sponge, he carefully washed the traces of blood from his face and shoulders, his arms and hands. The song of Edith the Swan's Neck occurred to him, and he sang gently. She saw them on his shoulder and covered them with her kisses. Three little scars, reminders of lust, where she had once bitten him. And Jacob laughed happily, because the words of love hurt him far far more than the others. Then he took a bath and dressed, and only when on the terrace did the question come to him. How would the girl greet him, and with what feelings had the new day brought her? He went into the guest room. The landlord came and brought his breakfast. The man seemed ill-humored and at once handed him the bill for last night's wine. You take no chances, Jacob raised his voice to be heard. Oh well, the old man said, better to be on the safe side. He gathered up the money, counted it carefully, and went out. The girl never came. Jacob finished his breakfast and then went into the garden. Perhaps she's on the lake, he thought to himself but no boat was to be seen anywhere. He took a walk and came back to dinner. Again, the old man waited on him, morose as ever. Could she have possibly told him something? Jacob thought to himself. But he could not force himself to ask. He did ask about the guard, however. He rode away hours ago, growled the landlord. He rode away in terrible misery. He was feeling more wretched even than I am. And what about my helmet? Jacob asked. Oh, yes, Raimondi nodded. I was to give you this message. He kept the helmet, because of course he couldn't ride without it. But he's going to buy a new one, and he'll bring the old one back when he comes this way again. Jacob nodded at this. And yes, where is? But he did not finish the sentence. She must be around here somewhere. He would succeed in finding her. In the afternoon, he went to his room, straightened out his books, and arranged everything for his work. He gnawed at his pen with nervous teeth, but he was in no mood to begin. Then he got up and went into her room directly. She was not there, so he went out, wandered through the narrow valley, 
up and down, hastily, nervously, impatiently. At supper, the landlord again brought in the dishes. Jacob couldn't wait any longer, so he asked quickly, Well, isn't your daughter here? The old man sat down beside him. His wretchedness seemed to have vanished, and with it his ill humor. Teresa, he said quietly, she's gone into town. Jacob nodded. He was glad to be rid of the unpleasant thought that perhaps she had betrayed something to her father. This had tormented him, although he had not believed it for a moment. To the city, Jacob repeated. Yes, said the old man. She wanted to see her father confess her. Her father confess her, Jacob thought. So she wanted to confess? He was confused. What a face Don Vincenzo would make when he heard of the curious effect and of his warning letter. Yet the situation did not give him a feeling that was entirely happy. Raimondi filled his pipe. I sent a letter with her, too. I wanted to thank him for having sent you here, he said. Jacob laughed a bit nervously at this. He had a keen sense of the ironic comedy of the situation. What in the world would the old priest answer? When did she leave, he asked. When? She left by stage at eleven o'clock. But the stage didn't leave today. Oh yes, today, replied the old man. Yesterday it went to Atola, and today it returned to the city. That's the reason Teresa went today. Otherwise, she would have to wait an entire week. Oh, said Jacob. And so she'll stay the entire week in the city, he asked. The landlord shook his head. Certainly not, he said. She'll probably stay with her aunt overnight and return on foot tomorrow. What will you have to drink today, sir? Nothing, Jacob answered. He got up and went to the door. The landlord looked at him and laid his pipe heavily on the table. Nothing to drink? Nothing at all? Jacob turned around. No, nothing at all, my friend. I am not given to drinking often. I have the impulse once, every few years. Years, replied the landlord. He got up, grasped his chin with his bony hand, and stroked it. Years, he stammered. Jacob saw that he had something more to say that he found difficult. He went up to him. Well then, what is it, he asked. Why, sir, the landlord stammered. I believe that you would drink a couple of bottles daily. No, Jacob interrupted. I'm not thinking of such a thing, and I suppose that is very unpleasant for you? The landlord said, Yes, you live here so cheaply. Cheaply, Jacob laughed. You call your prices cheap? Well, look here, Raimondi. It seems to me that what I pay you for board and lodging is rather considerable. Oh, yes, sir, said the landlord. I agree. But then it isn't only the food and lodging. Isn't it? asked Jacob. Well, what else is there? Raimondi hesitated. He spat thoughtfully, filled his pipe again, opened his lips and closed them. Sir, he said. Well, go on then, old man, said Jacob. Well, if I must say it, Weren't you with Teresa last night, he asked. He watched Jacob somewhat greedily from under his lids, as if lying in wait. Jacob was silent for a moment, hardly knowing just what to say. Why, did she tell you something, he asked. Raimondi shook his head. Oh no, no, no. She didn't say a thing. I heard you. Oh, is that so? So you heard me. I thought you were deaf as a post, Raimondi. I had to roar like a drill sergeant to make you understand me. 
In addition, you were drunk last night. You are nothing. Absolutely nothing. It's all in your imagination. But the landlord's little eyes twinkled, and he laughed a hoarse, dry laugh. Oh no, sir. It was not my imagination. You were with my girl, Teresa. Screamed. How she screamed. That woke me up, and I went upstairs. The door was open. The light was burning in the lamp. I saw you in her bed. I saw both of you. Jacob grasped him by the arm. And then Raimondi. Then you went calmly down the stairs again. The landlord nodded eagerly. Ah, oh, yes, sir, certainly. And you must pardon me if I wouldn't have said a word. Jacob laughed bitterly. If I were a more profitable guest, yes, if I were to drink a couple of bottles of wine daily, is that it? Well, sir, said the landlord. Jacob interrupted him sharply. Be silent, Raimondi. Nothing else you have to say interests me. Naturally, you must not lose a proper profit. Since I don't drink, I must make it up to you in other ways. He put his hand in his pocket and drew out several bills. Here, Jacob said, count them. He threw the bills on the table and went out. He read for hours before going to bed. Once again, he went to the window and looked out. Wasn't Teresa coming home? But the valley slept. So she is mine. Three times over, he murmured. First I took her by force. Then she gave herself to me. And finally, her father sold her to me. When he came down the next morning, Teresa brought him his breakfast. He greeted her joyfully and grasped her arm. She eluded him swiftly and said good day softly before hurrying out. He jumped up, followed her, but ran straight into her father at the door. So Teresa's back again, he asked. Yes, for just an hour, said the old man. She didn't see the priest, Jacob asked. She didn't see the priest? No. He is on an inspection trip. So she left my letter and returned again at once. So she walked the whole night to get back here? The landlord nodded. Yes, she walked the whole night. Jacob ate his breakfast very slowly. He hoped that Teresa would come back into the room, but she did not come. Later, he met her in the garden but she went away as he approached her. He tried this several times, on this day and on the following days, to speak with her. She avoided him, almost hid herself from him. Once he tried to enter her room at night, but he found the door to be locked. I'll let her be, he thought to himself. Still he desired her, but only superficially, half-consciously, and at moments. Usually he forgot her. His thoughts were on his work. He sat over his books until late into the night, arranged his tracks and tables, gathered the notes and excerpts that he had made during the years. He measured and weighed, made a plan, rejected it, then formed a new plan. And he saw his work grow, take on form and substance, become plastic and concretely visible. Laughing, he called it his mastodon. Now that he held Cuvier's bone in his hand. Once, he went to Mr. Peter's barn. The distant music never disturbed him. He only needed to place his earplugs in his ears. So he had almost forgotten the American's activity as he had Teresa's love. Once on a walk, he passed there, just as they were intoning a song within. He entered, stood far back by the door and listened. 
they sang the fasting song. Bid me all thy songs to sing, my compassion's offering bring. Lamb of God from blemish free, that took all my sins away from me. Let thy sorrow bear a part, deep in every Christian's heart. Let thy dying agony a solace in my heart to be. They sang all seven stanzas, most of them from memory, as only a few glanced at the hymnal. Jacob looked around him in the old barn. It was an immense place with three walls of stone. Only the front wall was made of planks. The transformation of the barn into a hall had been effected merely by breaking out the wooden ceiling, which, exactly in the middle, had divided the barn into two stories, and by using these boards to hide the rough inner gable of the roof. In addition, a window had been placed in the side wall which admitted a little air and light into the room. No real ecclesiastical decorations were to be seen anywhere. Only against the rear wall hung a rather large crucifix. The penitential meeting followed, in a general way, the services of the Salvation Army. They sang and prayed passionately, after which the American whose face Jacob could scarcely discern in the artificial twilight, preached penitence and fighting mightily against the devil, the father of all sins. Now and then he mixed with his speech some fine phrase in monstrous English, which had obviously clung to his memory from his experience in Pennsylvania. He urged his followers to practice penitence, and closed with a warm prayer. Then he asked whether anyone in the assembly desired to express his soul. A sturdy farmhand with a huge red goiter came forward. He related, stammering, that he had formerly been a frightful drunkard, that he had had only one thought, namely, wine. He had been drunk at least four times a week, and twice on Sunday. He fairly reveled in recollections of that sinful time, exaggerated fearfully, painting himself as black as possible, in order to radiate a now wider innocence. For now, the Lord Jesus had illuminated him with his grace, so that he now abominated drunkenness as the most horrible of vices, and found his sole happiness in aspirations toward the Lamb and toward the blood of the Savior. I was as black as the devil in hell, he grunted, but now I am clean through the grace of the Redeemer. God has guarded me from every sin for three months and will continue to do so. In other days I was full of wine. Today I am full of the Holy Ghost. The huge fellow turned his eyes to heaven. His voice sounded clucking and hoarse, and the large goiter expanded and swung to and fro. Jacob could not suppress a short laugh. For a moment, the glances of the assembly turned toward him. But immediately thereafter, the voices rose again in a fervent prayer to the Son of God. He made the observation that here, as with all fanatical sects, Jesus played the largest and almost the only part. From the minds of even these intensely Catholic hill peasants, the saints seemed to have vanished, and the Holy Virgin herself was scarcely mentioned. All the songs and prayers were taken from the Catholic prayer book of the Diocese of Trent, 
and except for the brief sermons and public confessions, the American had imported no new element into the old church. Somewhat disappointed and very much bored, Jacob left the hall as the assembly raised its voice for the fourth time in the fasting song. He thought that Don Vincenzo was probably right, and that these people would soon have quite enough of this mischievous nonsense. This American was hardly cut from the same wood as Father Vincenzo of Padua. Jacob sat at his desk at work, Days passed, and weeks, he saw nothing, heard nothing. Sometimes he glanced through the window at the lake, and then he had to remind himself where he really was. He now scarcely noticed that the girl avoided him. He talked to her as to any stranger, and only used her, like her father or Angelo the farmhand, when he desired some service. The sheets grew into a pile. This is how he wanted to begin. First, to shatter all that is, to destroy the very foundations, and then, on this open field, to build a new temple. Assured of victory, he hurled forth his denials. In large letters, he wrote the superscription to a certain chapter the Latin peoples. In the very first sentence, he cried out that the term was mere sound and fury, a ridiculous soap bubble, which burst in the air. He took up the various countries, the Pyrenean Peninsula, a certain people had once inhabited, Iberians, maybe. What did the name matter, though? Roman armies carried their language there. Roman armies that came from all the ends of the earth and were scarcely for a tenth part of its italic origin. Those conquered took on the language of their conquerors. That was all. And there was a racial blending of trifling unimportance. Then came the Goths. This time, The conquerors took on the language of the conquered. And again came the Moors and Berbers and Jews from the south, Franks from the north. To the west, however, came mixed folk from all the islands and coasts to Lusitania, new mixtures again and again. Only the language remained, the language of Rome. It conquered all the conquerors. And why did Latin take the land by storm and hold it firmly against centuries of long rules, strange idioms? Because the land had no language before the Romans came, no common tongue, only a hundred small languages. Exactly in the same way that the United States became English, that Mexico and the whole of South America submitted to the Spanish influence. They were a thousand tribes and all hostile to one another, a thousand languages and all strangers. Jacob laid down his pen and laughed. Once, somewhere in the Bolivian Chaco, he had met a powerful anteater. The fellow stood in a clearing, erect, on a tall white ant hill. He looked around him, curiously, silent and without fear. Then he dug in the loose sand with his front paws. It was as if he wanted to invite him to partake of this delicious meal. Swarming by the many thousands, the frightened ants ran around, and then the ant eater protruded his long, pointed, worm-like tongue and rolled it like a sticky snake along the fleeing insects. That is the Spanish tongue, thought Jacob. At one gulp it devours a hundred Italians. Damn, doggo, he had cried. 
and sent a bullet through the beast's head. At the time, he had hated the Spaniards, and that was how the language of Rome devoured a hundred languages of the peninsula. Only one survived, the Basque tongue of the northern mountains. And how long would it persist? Rome's language took root, tough and steadfast against all conquerors. To be sure, it split, was shredded and mixed, so that today the Castilian didn't understand a word of what the Catalan said, and the Gallego fell into dull silence when the Andalusian spoke to him. Nevertheless, Rome's language conquered. But where were the Latin folk now? There was a people in its land who had absorbed only a little drop of Latin blood even as later they absorbed that much more of the Gothic and Moorish and Jewish blood. And all of those admixtures had long since sweated it out again, and the ancient folk remained, conquered, conquering, always the same. What nonsense to call them Latin and Gaul, once conquered, accepted the language of Rome, and then imposed the same language upon the conquering Goths, Franks, and Normans. It derived its language from the conqueror, its name from the others, and yet it remained what it was. There was Romania, the land that had both the name and the language of Rome, and yet its people had only the tiniest drop of Roman blood less than any of the others. They had the blood of criminals, which, in the second century, the Emperor Trajan had transferred to the Danube. There remained Italy, the motherland, Greeks in the south, Gauls in the north. In between was Latium and Rome. Then, the innumerable slaves from all lands and zones, and finally, the Goths, Vandals, Langobards, Normans, Saracens, and always, again and again, through all the centuries, new yellow-haired hordes from across the Alps. Rome's language always subdued the conquerors. But what had the language to do with the race? Less than nothing, thought Jacob. Language was one thing, and race was another. There was nothing in common. Therefore, all deductions concerning the perception of radical individuality that were based on language must necessarily be false. How good it was, Jacob reflected, that history in the South was a trifle older it was scarcely more than two or three wretched millennia, but old enough to utterly shatter the fable of the Latin peoples. Otherwise, the folly concerning the oneness of the Latin as of the Slavic and Germanic races might persist eternally, merely because the oneness of the language was a fact. How easy it was to blow asunder the so-called Latin world, and how difficult the process was when applied to the Germanic and Slavic peoples, merely because the historical record was lacking. Here one had scarcely any points of departure, merely tiny wedges into the rough blocks of thick-skulled hypotheses. The Bulgars mixed with the Slavic-speaking people and gave the land the name of the conqueror, while they themselves assumed the language of the conquered, racial brothers of the Magyars. Yet the latter, like the Bulgars, were blended with the conquered, submerged in their folk ways, but they imposed on the conquered land both their name and their language. Jacob began to lose his way in his thoughts seeking with difficulty the scattered fragments of races. In this way, he took the Zilnars in Thessaly, 
most certainly related in race to the Mordwin Finnish of Kazan, and yet Latin in their language, and the Lops and the Klons of Scandinavia, who spoke Swedish or Finnish, and were yet neither Ugrian nor Germanic, then the Turkish, the strange Permians, the Vologda and the Archangel. Then he found his way back. He laid this new lance at rest and tilted against language with the flying banner. It amused him to write a long page in which each sentence was another tongue. And I am now a Russian, he laughed, and now a Spaniard, and now a Highland Gale. He took up his arrows wherever he could find them. He forged sharp points out of a hundred trifles which he had gathered up by the wayside. He recollected now, remembering, there was once a kindly college professor in Saxony. The man gave instruction in German, and with sincere feeling recited the odes of Klopstock to his boys. Then, by some chance, he was transferred to a remote little town in East Prussia. His work left him a great deal of leisure, and so, one fine day, he began to study Masurian. No human being today knows a single word of this language, but he asserted that the Masurians ought to know their mother tongue, and that it was, in truth, the finest language in the world. He translated Schiller, Klopstock, Ramler, Eichendorf, and all the patriotic poets into Masurian, and he really succeeded in founding a tiny political party. He ran on the ticket as the Masorian candidate and received several dozen votes. He discovered somehow a Masorian among the ancestors of Schiller, and of course, among his own. As things are now, he will know neither peace nor rest until all the land from the Elbe to the Duena is Masorian. Once upon a time he was German. Now he is a Masorian because he alone in the entire world can speak that ancient tongue. Language, thought Jacob. That was the lion's skin of all the asses. Jacob thought of Herr Frederick Wilhelm Bandmann who was a frame maker and dwelt in his native city next to the home of his parents. He was a bachelor and a mighty patriot, even more than the college professor. He swore by Bismarck and everything the latter did. Then, when Bismarck was deposed, his blood boiled. He sold his house and his business, got drunk one last time at the veterans club, and bidding a tearful farewell to all his comrades, went to America. The steamer landed at Hoboken, and since Herr Bandman didn't know a single word of English, he remained in this German city and crossed the river to New York just one single time with one companion. He remained there two hours and a half, but he didn't like New York any better than Hoboken. Therefore, he returned to Germany on the next steamer. He had been away for three weeks. Jacob had met him on the street and said, Well, Herr Bandmann, so you are back in Germany again. Then Herr Bandmann looked at him with astonishment and a sense of injury in his eyes and asked, You speak English? He had become an American, and Jacob wrote, My parrot speaks just as good of German as a preacher. He is undoubtedly of German blood.